that the role of the CIO has changed totally. You know, we were software developers and architects, and we could tell you what RAM to use based on its transactional speed. Do you think any of that matters anymore? The answer is no. Welcome to This Week in Health IT, where we discuss the news, information, and emerging thought with leaders from across the healthcare industry. My name is Bill Russell, recovering healthcare CIO, writer, and advisor with the previously mentioned Health Lyrics. I was the CIO for a 23,000 person health system, and one of the biggest challenges was to remain current on the technology and the trends that were going on myself. I think of um, artificial intelligence as a orchestra. Right now, machine learning, deep learning is getting a lot of attention, so I sort of equate that to the string section. And obviously, there are many sections to the orchestra, so someday soon, um, hospitals, healthcare organizations are going to be able to have amazing music. We are seeing instances of folks popping up, us included, where we're um, having a primary care position set up with a dentist in the same office. I would love to get to the space where eventually we're using voice recognition to do all of our navigation throughout the electronic health record. When uh, when we worked at Microsoft, oftentimes, you know, you'd have crazy deadlines. You know, people would say, look, we're not saving anyone's life here. We can't say that anymore. And, and we love that, you know, it's like we can, we can save someone's life. We can prevent a, a complication or a remission by catching it. A lot of the feedback people are hearing about uh, Vice President, former Vice President's uh, remarks is that he was remarkably pragmatic. And then the one that I'm most excited about, he notes that the Medicare Innovation Center, which was created by the Affordable Care Act, has the legal authority to experiment with new models to engage patients for purposes of getting better valued care. Hyper-consumerism, driving everything to a digital experience because if we don't make it easy for patients like ourselves to use healthcare on our smart devices, companies like Apple are starting to do it for us. I think we're, we're right on the cusp of a, a huge digital transformation. It'll be interesting to see how CIOs sort of address that. Welcome to This Week in Health IT, where we discuss the news, information, and emerging thought with leaders from across the healthcare industry. This is episode number 36. Today we talk Apple and opioids, more specifically legislation to fight their proliferation, opioids, not Apple. Uh, this, uh, this podcast is brought to you by Health Lyrics. Health systems are moving to the cloud to gain agility, efficiency, and new capabilities. Work with a trusted partner that has been moving health systems to the cloud since 2010. Visit healthlyrics.com to schedule your free consultation. My name is Bill Russell, recovering healthcare CIO, writer, advisor with the previously mentioned Health Lyrics. Uh, before I get to our guest, I want to make everyone aware of uh, our great resource for your IT teams. This Week in Health IT has a YouTube channel with great insights from industry influencers like our guest today. Short segments, complete episodes, all curated for easy access. Uh, every week we add another uh, seven or eight videos uh, to the collection. Uh, and it's now up uh, uh, well over 300 videos uh, at this moment. So check it out today at thisweekinhealthit.com slash video and share it with your colleagues. Uh, today's guest is a returning host from episode 12. Wow, it, it, it's really been, it's been a long time. And, and, and the host of the HIMSS SoCal podcast. Today we are joined by Sarah Richardson of Healthcare Partners at DaVita Medical Group. Good morning, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Bill. Thanks for having me back. Wow, you're like a professional. You have such a great podcast with the uh, SoCal Hymns uh, podcast. And, and by great podcast, I mean great guests, great topics. Uh, you know, what, what do you think the best thing is about, about doing a podcast from your perspective? Oh, gosh. You know, that's funny. It started out as a sort of a pet project for us at SoCal Hymns to see how we could expand our educational footprint of topics that were relevant in the industry. What we found out was that there is a ton of content out there. And so many people who are willing to share that information with others. And so I think what we love about it is that it forces us to go and say, hey, we need to be talking about these topics. And it may not be topics where we're the subject matter expert, clearly. So in order to thoughtfully do that interview, you have to, A, go cold the talent to have come, come, come have a conversation. And then you have to do your research uh, before they show up. And so what most people don't know is that we record those in bulk. So we'll sit, set a Saturday aside and record like four or five hours of worth of shows. So those like those days leading up to that day, I feel like I'm I feel like I'm a college student cramming for an exam because every topic's pretty pretty intense. 
and then having to go and create all these different questions, et cetera. But I'm fortunate enough to have the contacts that I can reach out to colleagues and I know that it's going to be a great show because no one's going to try to trump anybody up on a podcast. It's all about sharing of ideas and information. So it's just been a great journey. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes people are nervous about coming on this podcast and I'm like, look, my job is to, is to bring out the best in you. It's not to like stump you with, with the questions. Yeah. Yeah, I give them the questions ahead of time. I let them send me their questions, et cetera. The whole point is to like have a great conversation about a cool topic that all of us need to know about in today's uh, HIT world. Yeah, so you guys have covered a lot of great uh, cybersecurity, innovation, uh, cloud computing. Uh, what are, what are some, uh, who are some of your guests and, and what are some of the things you've talked about? Oh, absolutely. So we've had Sajid Ahmed talk about artificial intelligence. We just did this month's, the September episode that comes out actually today. Um, is Dr. Anthony Chang, uh, another level of AI, being interviewed by Alan Young. So it's great. Alan's been our first guest podcaster from a host perspective, and he's on our SoCal board as well, um, which is very cool. And we've had everything from people talking about leadership traits. So in the next, like, in the next four months, you're going to hear from Drex to Ford about relentless prioritization and governance. You're going to hear from uh, Tom Stafford about 10 leadership principles. Um, they're gonna, we had a conversation with Finland, really, about how they host medicine and their thoughts around R&D. And we chose Finland because that's where HIMSS Europe is going to be over the next three years. And so we've created that partnership with Finland as well. So um, those are the types of topics that are coming up. And then I've got a whole slew of people that I'm reaching out to. And if I'm one of my favorites is that we're going to have Senator Ed Hernandez on the show, uh, recording with us in October, to talk about his state HIT agenda and really how we can be, continue to be huge advocates. Because... Uh, on the side, I took on this year the VP of Advocacy for SoCal Hymns and uh, just the importance of how we can affect legislation. And you see that you know, in the opioid epidemic with what Chime is doing and other uh, leaders in the industry. Yeah, so you're, you're heading off to Washington soon for that, uh, for that get together, is that, is that right? It is, it's the first uh, annual Chime uh, Policy Summit. It's October 3rd through the 5th, it's on Capitol Hill, it's in DC. What's really good about that, Bill, is that a few years ago, the HIMSS chapters used to go to DC and do like the National HIT Week, which is October 8th through the 12th this year. And now we do, about two years ago, it switched over to state levels. So now you do like state HIT days, we do ours in May in California. So there's really been that gap of how do you get your HIT advocates onto Capitol Hill? Well, Chime is, is stepping in and doing that work, and Chime's been so active with policy anyway, and Cletus Earl's been leading that for, for Chime for a bit this last year, that um, it's really cool that we're going to be able to start to have a reciprocal way to get to Washington and be heard uh, and really combine our state and our local efforts. Wow, that's awesome. So the last time we checked in with you, again, it's been 20 some odd weeks, oh. uh, it was yeah, Optum, uh, uh, healthcare partners, uh, Davida Medical Group, all coming together. Uh, what's the update on that? How's that going? It's going well, and we are we're still anticipated to close in 2018, so it's still in process, and we're hopeful that it happens this year. I think anybody that's been through it knows that uh, an acquisition of this magnitude takes time, and we're just in that final you know checks and balances of making sure everything's the way that it's supposed to be, and of course, the FTC makes the final decision, and so we're hopeful that it happens this year. Um, that's where all of our time and energy has been spent is what we call day one readiness. And when you spend probably the last two and a half to three years combining all of your HIT and your IT resources into a shared service like we did with the DaVita umbrella, which was phenomenal. We were just about done creating a singular IT organization for all of DaVita, inclusive of kidney care. And they go, hey, by the way, uh, you're being sold and now you need to undo all the work that you did over the last two and a half years. So that's really been the last few months of my life is making sure that we are an independent medical group again, ready for day one once the transaction finally closes. Yeah, it's, it, it's amazing. So one of the things we like to do with our guests is just, um, we just talked about a bunch of things that you're doing, um, but you know, what are some of the things that you're working on that you're excited about uh, right now? I would say for work, it it's continues to be to build that independent team. So you know, what's wonderful about the whole healthcare partners footprint in Southern California is that it's always been a series of acquisitions and really select acquisitions to become you know, the leading independent medical group in SoCal. And being able to do that again, just basically able to say, hey, we're now we're going to go back to being uh, a medical group owned by a medical group organization, essentially. But when you really bring your teams through that journey, it's watching them be able to say, okay, we did all this work, and then we need to essentially undo the work. But we're not really undoing something. We're building something a little bit different and stronger than before. And so I've been excited about the fact that our teams have just, I mean, heads down, getting the work done looking forward to the continued future like they've always done. Uh, probably most pressing was in a, um, in a recent town hall with the team. 
And there's just, you know, anytime there's change, there's strife. And one of our managers said, hey guys, I've been with the organization 25 years, and that means I've been acquired seven times throughout the journey of healthcare partners. So this is just one more step in that journey. And she's such a pillar on our team. And everybody was like, oh, right, we can do this again. And so I feel like it's the ability for the team to focus on being able to become part of something even bigger than what they were and realize that their future is, is very much in front of them and uh, that they have control over that. Yeah, Sue Shade and I did a show on uh, M&A and she, she took the role of the acquiring uh, entity and I took the role of the CIO of the being acquired entity and we just talked about the different things. And one of the things uh, I made it a point is that, you know, in, in being the acquired entity, a lot of times that opens up a whole set of new opportunities uh, for the organization. And so people sometimes get skittish and want to jump ship, but in reality, it could be the best thing to happen to your career to be acquired by another entity. Especially one that's like, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's a fortune six company. And I'm like, guys, there's going to be more, more opportunities than you've ever even considered in, in your life before. And, and it helps too. I think that if people like me and others have, are, are totally set, we're, we're like, we're looking forward to it. We're ready to go. We're not even, even ex exhibiting any kind of concern only because Hey, I, I've done this before, but more importantly, we're, we're on the right trajectory. And so when, you're, when your leaders are comfortable and they're, they're excited about what's coming, then I think it helps the team assemble a little better too. Fantastic. All right, so on the, on the show, we do two things. We do in the news and sound bites. Um, in the news, we each pick a story and discuss, and we've got a lot to talk about this week. And in the sound bite sections, I just ask you a series of questions that I have shared with you earlier, not too much yeah. earlier. I, I assume you <laughs> did your homework <laughs> yesterday. Uh, uh, I'm going to give you the first story. So uh, go ahead and, and share your story and, and give us a little background. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as, as I get more and more involved in the advocacy realm of things, there are, there are four key things that really the Chime advocacy teams are focusing on at a national level. It's cybersecurity, interoperability, uh, opioid epidemic, and telemedicine. Um, all very relevant. And, and what's probably the most pressing in some cases is the opioid epidemic because in our, you know, we don't necessarily hear about it as much. We hear about the things that we can do to do like EPCS and, and help our physicians get in front of that. But, you know, I personally haven't been affected by anybody with opioids, but I know it's real, it's very prevalent. I mean, 70,000 people a year are dying from opioid overdose, overdoses. And it's not like the people you would expect it. it. I'm surprised I don't know anybody and I'm grateful that I haven't. And so when you think about things that you can advocate for, uh, the Senate was actually voting this week on a bill that you can get fentanyl, which is 50 times stronger than heroin, uh, mail order through China, through the US Postal Service. And uh, the Senate's voting on a bill to ask the USPS to have to register these packages that are coming in. It's something that FedEx and DHL and UPS already do. So you can at least get in front of the fact that you can mail order some of the strongest opioids out there in the world and to, and to figure out a way to get in front of that more than just you know through the HIT efforts. And so. I'm grateful that uh, we have such uh, visibility into it at a national level. I feel like it's something that's not partisan. You know, whether it doesn't matter what your politics are, it's a problem. And you see people coming together at a time when they've been more divided than ever on helping uh, people overcome an addiction and creating policy that allows for that to potentially be a true statement. Yeah, I, I also noticed that in the bill, it has, uh, it accelerates the research uh, to develop non-addictive painkillers and alternatives to opioids, uh, which is, you know, I, I guess they call it really the silver bullet if you can get a non-addictive uh, painkiller. Uh, and, and so that's a great step as well. All right, so that's a regulatory step that's being taken, and we appreciate that. Um, it's interesting, when I had uh, uh, Ann Weiler on the show, uh, the CEO from Wellpepper, which is a digital startup, she discussed how HCAPS is a potential driver for over-prescribing. So HCAPS Mm -hmm. As a score, as you know, of, you know, how was your pain managed? And, and I, she shared the story, you know, so when someone subscribed opioids after total joint replacement uh, surgery, uh, they're, they're typically prescribed a large number uh, because you can only prescribe them in person. And so if they're having joint replacement, they can't get back into the, to, they struggle to get back in to, to get the uh, prescription refilled. So they so they overprescribe, and then so two things happen: either they take them all, or it ends up in a medicine cabinet for you know a high school kid or 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 younger to to take. And um, and you know, and she actually shared a, a patient story. They were doing some some research, and one of the patient stories, you know, a good patient said, "Well, 
I took all the op opioids. And I said, well, you know, what, was it because of your pain? And the answer was, no, it wasn't because of my pain. It's because my doctor prescribed it to me. I assumed I was supposed to take it. Um, so, you know, the, the legislation is one aspect of it, uh, but there's still, uh, you know, there's still a policy challenge uh, in, in the unintended consequences of, of the age cap measure uh, and, and some other things. But one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is, uh, so we're going to be the ones in the room uh, and we're going to be asked the role of technology can play in addressing uh, this crisis. What do you think are some of the things that you're seeing out there from a technology perspective or from technology partners uh, that may help in addressing this challenge, do you think? No, it's, it's an excellent question, Bill, because you think about the fact that um, that first, I mean, you've got the, you've got the med, med adherence, but med adherence isn't about taking your opioids. Med adherence is about making sure you're taking your statins and other things that were being measured on. So you think about the reconciliation process when a patient leaves the hospital or even leaves a post-acute setting, what that follow-up looks like and what kind of education materials we can give to them whether it's a patient portal or another SMS push technology or messenger service that allows us to be able to say, here's the education behind your opioids and here's what you should do if you don't need all of them. Like here's how you can get rid of them. Or if you do need them, here's how we can call you and get you really in the care management plan that helps to manage your pain or manage the issue that's at hand. Um, but there's a few things that are in flight. There's the Overdose Protection and Patient Safety Act that allows us to manage opioid records, but they don't necessarily get shared because of HIPAA. So how do you create opportunity for um, drug treatment or diagnoses that are out there in the EHRs to be interoperable to share those specific details? Because you get this blob of data in a CCDA, you're not going to go look to see, hey, Bill got fentanyl for this at one point. Um, so there's the interoperability, there's the ability to share the drug history records. Um, telehealth to me continues to be a space where if you can, so like you think at federally qualified health centers aren't allowed to bill for telemedicine right now. And a lot of the um, people in the US that have an addiction to opioid may go to those locations for care. And if there's not a way for that uh, provider or for that patient to be able to have access to either maybe a behavioral health uh, advocate or someone who can help them manage that care more effectively in a setting of where they are, then we're gonna to continue to put ourselves at risk at some of our uh, most vulnerable populations. So using the tools we already have, um, just making them very specific to something that's been identified as a very worthy cause. Yeah, and I like uh, uh, the aspect of education here, I think it is really key. Sometimes recording those uh, conversations that the physicians have at the end where they're uh, giving the uh, care plan and the care instructions, recording those and, and, and putting those into a portal so that they can be at, watched later. I know that with my my family, I'd like to see what the doctor actually said because I'm not in the room and they're like, well, I, I don't know what she said. She said this and this and I'm like, oh man, uh, you know, so how do we know what's right? So recording those things is interesting. I think the one of the more interesting things I've seen in, in my career was I saw a design agency that worked with a hospital in Chicago and they took their discharge documents and they did, uh, I think like a 90 day uh, program with them and design thinking and really redid uh, the discharge. And they, they gave, I wish I had a copy, but they gave me a copy of it. Uh, in fact, I know who to reach out to. I'm gonna reach out and get it because it, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Um, that they took this really complex, you know, five page thing that they handed somebody and they made it into a front and back color coordinated, uh, really interesting pictures. And I just looked at it and I'm like, and they said, you know, fifth grade reading level. And I looked at it, I'm like, yeah, it's pictures. It's, and it was very clear what I was supposed to do. And I think it was for asthma. And, and I was like, it's very clear, you know, when I'm supposed to just, you know, take my inhaler. It's very clear when I'm supposed to go to an emergency room and and that kind of that kind of thing maybe not falling within technology but the whole idea of bringing design thinking into the organization is something that IT really can uh, facilitate and help with I think oh absolutely and you think about when your patient if you know a patient has a prescription for an opioid it's, it's some of those like in your face numbers like and we don't want you to become a statistic 72,000 people a year are dying from this as an addiction. And here's what we're going to do to make sure that you only take this as long as you absolutely need it kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's great. I'll, I'll let you have the last word. Is there anything else you want to say on that story before we get to, you know, the flashiest story of the, of the week? 
What I would just share with those of, uh, that are listening and our peers is that if you're not aware of what's going on both in, in Congress and across the board with opioid epidemic, become familiar with it because if it hasn't happened to you uh, and so in your world that you know about, it very well may and you want to know what resources are available to help someone who may be suffering from something like this. Yeah, and it's great to see Chime taking a lead and, and it's great to just plug right into that uh, for, uh, for those of us who are uh, connected with Chime and looking forward to it. Looking forward to having you on the show. Let's see, it's been 24 episodes. So the next time we'll have you on is sometime in the spring and hopefully we'll hear more about what you're doing uh, in that role with, uh, with advocacy. It should, should be interesting. Um, so I feel, kind of, I, I feel kind of wimpy here. I took, the, I took the easy story, but I think it's something we should talk about. It's, it's already getting uh, play uh, in the physician community and, and some other things. So Apple unveils its uh, Watch Series 4 with FDA-approved ECG. So uh, you can find the story anywhere. I'm actually looking at the healthcare IT news story. And, you know, the, the big thing is right there in the title, FDA-approved ECG on the Apple Watch uh, was one of the big reveals. And that's, uh, you know, and that's pretty exciting to have that on your, on your um wrist and you can just touch the digital crown you can get the ecg done uh and, but i thought the more interesting one to me was the fall prevention uh work that they had done and so the fall fall prevention is when it detects a fall they uh you know they can tell if you slipped if you fell forward because the actions uh, are pretty standard and and the watch would sort of track that and uh so if you if you fall it uh, will initiate a, an SOS call and you can, or it'll pull it up. So all you have to do is hit a button and you can actually call somebody. So the, the famous, I've, I've fallen and I can't get up, it, the Apple Watch will, will function as that. Uh, the second thing is if you fall and are immobile and don't move for 60 seconds, it will actually make that emer uh, call that emergency contact for you. And uh, I, I would assume give your GPS and those kinds of uh, those kinds of settings. So the Apple Watch is really becoming a uh, a, a medical device. I mean, it, clearly, I mean it's FDA approved, and they are continuing to push in this direction. Uh, so I guess let's start here. So where does this fit in the strategy? Are we uh, let's see? Are we issuing an Apple Watch to all patients? of a certain acuity in the hospital so that if they fall in the hospital, we find, you know, we, we know if they, or our home care is probably a better case. Mm -hmm. uh, should I buy one for my, my parents and, and my father-in-law who are in their eighties so I can have peace of mind and set me up as the emergency contact. So if they fall, I, yeah, you know, and they, they live, my, my father-in-law lives on his own. So if he falls, that would be, it would be great for my, my wife to get a, a phone call and, and be able to help them in that time. So where does it fit? Where does it fit in the overall IT strategy and and, and really health system strategy, do you think? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, it was interesting when I saw, when I saw that they'd unveiled the ability to do, you know, the EKG or the, um, the elevated heart rate. What I love about it is I think it, we, we sometimes discount that our, our baby boomers and our seniors, and there's a thousand people every day in the state of California aging into Medicare eligibility and so that, I mean, that whole population is very tech savvy. I literally, so I share a plan with my mom. She's almost 76, a data plan. I had to go unlimited data. This is a woman who didn't want a smartphone. And now she's like, I mean, literally, I feel like I, feel like I have a teenager for all the right reasons. I had to go on unlimited data plan because my mom is online so much on her smartphone. She's like, wow, these apps really use a lot of data. I'm like, yes, they do. <laughs> um, so part of that, what I think is great about what Apple is doing is that they have slowly integrated themselves into a population that was historically seen as being maybe uh, scared of technology or not as much of an adopter. And now it's not a big deal. I could give my mother an Apple Watch and I probably, thank goodness, I already have unlimited data. It's one of those things that it would be one more thing in her technical ecosystem. And she has Alexa and she helps her out with all kinds of different things that she's looking to do. So I remember last year at uh, HIMSS, the day before HIMSS, we always had the big CHIME conference. And one of our first speakers talked about the fact that hospital systems that are early adopters of taking high-risk patients, like somebody who has CHF and or COPD, a pretty uh, common combo of being a high likelihood for readmission, sending that patient home with an eye watch to look for elevated heart rate and to look for just different anomalies that may be occurring to provide that intervention 
ahead of time and call them and potentially prevent them from having to go to the ER and be able to get in front of those types of things. We are at the precipice of this. And it'll be some of the larger health systems that maybe take this on initially, but it's the beginning of being able to say, if I'm wearing an eye watch and it starts to track my body temperature, and for two or three days, I've had a fluctuation in body temperature and a fluctuation in my heart rate that I wasn't anticipating or I wasn't even paying attention to, but it's actually the sign of like a pending infection, then my watch is gonna tell me ahead of time that even I may have something going on um, so it's, right now it's maybe high risk patients and, and that are at risk of being readmitted. But at the end of the day, it's going to be people that are in their forties like me who maybe have something going on that we weren't even aware of because it's not happening at a, at a very acute level. Yeah. John Halopka and I last week talked about uh, the role of incentives and how 80% of their patients now at Beth Israel Deaconess are mm-hmm. at risk. So they're not at risk health, but the, the health system has taken risk uh, in terms of the contract to manage that patient. So they're only getting a fixed amount of money to manage those, uh, those patients. And that really changes the paradigm. So, you know, giving somebody a $300 watch to go home with uh, might make sense if you, if you have a risk-based contract and you need to, to monitor those things. If we're still in a, a fee-for-service model, you're maybe not looking at uh, these kinds of alternative models. But if if it matters to you what's happening at the home, not I, I understand it matters to everybody from an altruistic standpoint, but if it matters from a financial standpoint, you're, then you're saying, hey, this $200, $300 investment makes sense to manage, uh, to make sure that we're monitoring this person on a you know, 724 basis so that uh, they don't become uh, you know, to, to a higher acuity and higher uh, level of need. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, you, you guys have a fair amount of uh, at-risk population that you, that you manage. Um, do you see this? Uh, you, you, I know you said we're at the precipice, but do you see like an Apple Watch strategy or um, or a device strategy uh, in the home that CIO should be thinking about? And I, you know, that patient-centered medical home has has been a topic for a while. But where do you? How do you see that playing out? No, it's already there. So we have uh, a lot of disease management and high-risk program management with our care managers because we are, we're risk. We do take almost full delegation from 14 health plans for all of our patient populations. And so we're, we're already in that boat. And we do for things like COPD and diabetes and CHF, we have programs where we have the disease managers. And if we know that you're discharged into a high-risk program, we have, um, your, we have the IVR, we have a phone call you, you know, every two or three days. And based on your responses, we know to have someone do an intervention, et cetera. So um, and we started adding technology for, we send people home with a home monitoring kit for 30 days for COPD and make sure that they're doing well. And if they show improvement, then obviously we discharge it from the, from the, the kit, but we still monitor them, et cetera. Um, it can, you just continue to add the things that make sense for your population. And so most places are already doing things like that. Home, home monitoring is not new. It's a matter of, to your point, are we altruistic about it or are we just delegated for it? I think I'm lucky in that we are delegated for it, but we've been delegated for so long that is part of who we are. Uh, it may be an altruistic mission, but it's also the right thing to do. I'm grateful to work for a healthcare organization that does the right thing, uh, perhaps based on some of our modeling, but it's, it's wonderful to know that we are 100% responsible for the care coordination of that patient. And so adding technology to help them be healthier um, is really one of the funnest parts of my job. Yeah, and I think we're seeing more and more systems uh, go at risk. And I, I think the more interesting story uh, for, for me from this year was uh, from the JP Morgan conference was Intermountain saying, we've, we've selected a, a zip code of, uh, you know, a, a population that has very poor health outcomes, and we're going at risk with Medicaid for that population. So Intermountain's doing a, a whole lot of work to try to figure out how to, to bring the level of that whole population up and and literally and we had mark probes on the on the show and he was saying you know literally you know from this side of the street to this side of the street you know someone could live an extra five years and that's just doesn't make any sense and so they're wading into social determinants they're wading into technology they're wading into uh you know making sure that uh i mean not in not in salt lake but making sure that they have air conditioning making sure they have uh Mm -hmm. you know access to people and so that's I, I think we all agree that that's the future. The future of medicine is uh, more continuous, more uh, where the, the healthcare provider acts as the, uh, the, the expert that 
uh, is is culling through that information and uh, proactively reaching out and, and managing the the population in that community. So this, I think the Apple Watch is is interesting. I think it's just like you said, it's on the precipice. So I'm looking forward to a fair number of pilots and integrations with this uh, in the health system. But what do you say to, you know, so one of the tweets from this morning was, uh, what about all the fa false positives? What, you know, who's going to pay for the false positives on the, on the falls and that kind of stuff? And that was from a physician. And, um, you know, that's, that's going to be kind of the, the pushback I think we get on this kind of technology. I, I'll, I'll give you the last word on this as well, if you'd like. One thing I love about Apple is it creates conversation and the conversation that it drives allows them to think about what to put into their next release or their next thing that they're going to be doing to uh, connect people and take better care, help take better care of patients. And what I love about, you know, and everyone knows I'm a big Apple fan, so it's like fine, I'm always this evangelist of Apple. What I love is that they are taking the very best of what uh, technology has to offer and incorporating it into things that we are already comfortable with. So you see them introduce the product and then all the benefits that it can have. So it becomes ubiquitous with, of how we do every day. So it, it's not a surprise. The next thing is gonna you know, be um, <clears throat> the ability to connect directly with your physician and, and do your you know, video visit from your watch, et cetera. So you know, kudos to Apple for creating uh, both solutions and controversy around doing the right thing. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, yeah, and I am, I'm really excited about this. So let's, we'll transition to uh, sound bites now. So during this uh, section, I asked, toss out about five questions, uh, one to three minute answers. Uh, you know, if you go longer, I don't stop you. It's more of a guideline than a rule. Uh, and if you want, you can throw questions back at me. I can't guarantee answers because I have not prepared any answers to these questions, but we can, uh, we can see what happens. So first question, your, your, uh, your system's a leader in coordinated care, value-based care. What foundational technologies enable healthcare partners to excel in this area? We are amazingly talented at population health. We built our own platform, you know, 20 years ago before it was even a, before population health was even a thing, healthcare partners was doing it. Um, that's heavy though. That's about utilization management, care management, disease management an incredibly robust warehouse with very deep analytics and reporting capabilities on top of it. And I think one of our favorite things is that we grow, we've grown up running our own gap lists and creating our own metrics. So the blessing and the curse is all of that, is that now that most of this stuff is mainstream, these, these tools and technologies, it's us adapting all of our processes into what's off the shelf. So we are at the phase where we can now retire our homegrown stuff, go mainstream, and then use all of that talent that we have in house to build tools that don't exist in the marketplace today that we need. Uh, so we've always been at the front end of a lot of the things that you're seeing be off the shelf today, um, but we've always done it with just really deep analytics and, and probably a, an incredible understanding of what it takes to maintain a healthy population. That's awesome. So that, that segues into our, the second question, which is, uh, you know, analytics is, is so foundational to everything we do. Uh, in care and especially value-based care. So give us an idea of uh, how a new measure or metric goes from idea to operational dashboard in your organization. How does the idea get off the ground, get approved, assigned resources, built, and then operationalized? It's a good question. So I'll start, with, we're not unique in that we use steering committees and uh, to help drive what needs to go into the tool sets that we utilize. So obviously you're going to get the regulatory and compliance things that you handed down. Hey, there's new HEDIS measures. Hey, there's new P4P. Hey, there's new STARS. Hey, there's new things we need to be thinking about. Um, that all goes into basically our think tank of this one steering committee. We figure out what pieces need to go into what we call the, the, pay, the physician intervention or the physician information portal, which creates our um, patient intervention reports. Like these are the things you need to be talking to your patients about, et cetera. Um, it's always this think tank of ideas and sharing what's coming. So we're fortunate. We've got people who sit on APG. We've got people that uh, are connected with all of our health plans. We've just, we're kind of all over the state and we bring that information back into our organization and be like, hey, this is the requirement, but then how are we going to do more than just meet that? So we are not in the business of checking a box and meeting a requirement. We're like, here's what, here's why it exists. Or here's what we need to be doing. And here's what that looks like in our organization. So our goal is always to create what we think are the exceeding uh, metrics that go along with that. And there's a lot of creativity that goes into that. So that's why so many of the things that we've built, anybody who's been a part of a healthcare organization for a long time knows that what I call the, um, 
the sort of organizational architecture of how your systems are built. It looks like, we call it the spaghetti diagram. And it literally looks like that. It's very, it's a beautiful diagram, but I'll tell you, it's like a board game. There's so many pieces and connections and parts and things that have to work well. Um, but now we've also learned that not only is it important to bring an idea in, how we're gonna build, design, test, implement, maintain, et cetera. Do we buy versus build? Who's gonna manage it? What does the reporting functionality look like? How are we gonna use the data? How do we refine it? It's also, a, how are we documenting this so that we aren't creating a monster for ourselves? We almost have to think about that internal interoperability as we build for the future. Yeah, it, it's interesting to me, I, you're now the second person I've asked that question to, and I'm, I'm gonna keep asking it, because each organization has a different flavor for how analytics uh, gets operationalized within their organization. Um, and some have a very distrib distributed governance model. Obviously, the, the, the regulatory ones are easy, and the business ones, some of the business ones are pretty easy. You know, you have to do certain mm -hmm. things for uh, the, the payment models that, you, that impact your physicians, and you have to do certain things from a regulatory standpoint. But then there's a whole host of ways that analytics bubbles up that I, I find fascinating to look at the differences of how organizations function. It's everywhere. So it's, it, for us, it's, we're always getting better at it because we have so many spaces that can do analytics. So you give people access to your warehouse with reporting and just know what that means. Yeah, and that's, and that's the golden ticket, right? We've, we've often talked about when you can get analytics for your health system to be Google-esque or ask, you know, ask Siri or ask, um, you know, Alexa, you know, how many, how many of this or how many of that, and you just get the response back. In fact, that's what uh, my C CEO asked me for is I want it to be like Google. I want to ask about our health system or our population, and I want, I want it to give me answers back like Google. I'm like, I don't, I'm... I understand what you're asking for. You, you want the ease, ease of finding the information, but Google doesn't come back with, generally doesn't come back with a specific answer. They come back with, hey, here's 100, and then you as a person have to go through and go, I think it's this link or this link. Mm -hmm. So uh, the most cost-effective uh, care, obviously, is preventative home-based, and we just talked about this with the Apple announcement, but I wanted to walk through some other technologies with you uh, to get your thoughts on how they um, how that will be applied to build healthy communities, let's start with uh, with the easiest and most prevalent today, at least, and that's telehealth. So, uh, how is that going to be utilized in home based care? Are we at the beginning? Or are we starting to see this mature? It, well, to, it's both. We're at, we're at the beginning, and you're starting to see it mature where people have a level of comfort with the technology. So, again, how many people have you know Alexa or or the Google device in their home? And they're already using it to do interaction. Well, now you, you do have the video component that's available on that and being able to just go and, and speak with your doctor or, or connect to a healthcare provider if you need it. Um, and it, so it just becomes, again, that ubiquity of healthcare is as easy for me as making a reservation or ordering flowers or, or doing anything else. And so it just becomes part of the whole ecosystem. So it's, it's out there and it's available. It becomes more prevalent once you know that you can easily connect to your healthcare provider, your healthcare agency um, through that technology. Yeah, so access is going to be a lot easier with telehealth. What about IoT and sensors? If you want to wear them. So here's the other piece. Like the Apple Watch is great if you wear an Apple Watch. So if you're going to have sensors or wearables be part of how we manage uh, healthcare, I personally don't wear an Apple Watch. And mine's more about fashion than anything else, and I'm totally honest about that. I mean, I'm the first one to tell you I don't want to wear the same watch as everybody else. I already carry the same phone as everybody else, and I, changing my band doesn't do it for me kind of thing. So... Um, it's a matter of how pervasively people want to be uh, in that space. People make, think I'm crazy. I'd rather have a chip in my neck than have to wear a watch because I don't have to remember the chip in my neck. And someone's like, oh, that's too, that's too invasive. I'm like, you're already, carry, you're already carrying your chip every day, everywhere you go. It's a matter of where you put it. Right. Well, I mean, you, 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 there's also passive sensors as well, right? So you can put them in a pillow, you can put them in a bed, uh, you can put them in a pill. Um, so do you think... Do uh, you think we're just going to see more and more sensors start to surround the patient community? Community, You will. And again, I'm hopeful that it's still the patient's choice as far as of the, the value that the um, invasive feeling that it may have with it. So there's a bit of that big brother feeling when you have too many sensors or too many things around you. Uh, so I'm hopeful that we still allow it to be the choice of the patient uh, before we assume that that's what they're going to want. Absolutely. So, you know, this is an interesting one. I'm getting more and more conversations with, um, 
with people that, because people like to talk to me about emerging technologies, and this is one of those that's uh, on the edge right now, but that's chatbots and natural uh, conversation with technology. Um, uh, you know, do, do you see this? Are, are, are you starting to experiment with it? Are you starting to see uh, other uh, technology partners come in and talk to you about chatbots and, and natural language uh, interaction? I, I have been. What I love is there's the um, uh, innovation lab at Cedar sinai and some of the recent uh, groups that have come through with them are those really uh, playing in this space and, and taking, again, the Lexotype technology and utilizing it for inpatient settings so that you can use that device to say, um, you know, let's just say it's Alexa, hey, Alexa, I'm cold or I need to use the restroom or I'm hungry, and then that, that command is able to go and direct that request to the appropriate level of individual in the hospital. So a patient technician can bring you the blanket, whereas the nurse practitioner maybe needs to come and give you a dosage of your medication. Um, so there's just really cool technologies that we're already integrating into that uh, into that space. But you can have the, you know, there's the chatbots that run on rules and the ones that only are smart or do the things that you tell it to do. I think where we're headed is the ones that are really based on machine learning and use artificial intelligence to truly learn the language. And so you can have a conversation uh, with that with that chatbot. Um, you can even, uh, it was so cool, we were at a Chime event uh, last week in Chicago and Russ Brenzel's like, here's the chatbot dog. He's like, I want this dog and I couldn't get one. They're sold out for like all this period of time. But it literally like, if you're gone for like three or four days, this chatbot dog already knows to be mad at you for two days because you left it alone. <laughs> Until it learns, you know, how to be happy to see you in these different things. So we're absolutely on our way there. Um, while today chatbots aren't used as prevalently for medicine, um, I think of the number one use case going forward is that, because we, we do a lot with seniors, is that seniors get depressed because they get lonely. Yeah. And if you think about the chatbot that can be conversational and really becomes that senior's friend and is managing their care and everything else about them, we're going to see longevity in seniors due to the ability for a chatbot to, to become its friend. Yeah, and chatbot, because of the nature of machine learning, and because of the nature of, of healthcare, because you cannot make a mistake, and machine learning learns through iteration just over time, it gets smarter and smarter and smarter. Mm -hmm. But the problem is we can't have like, hey, it's 95% accurate in making any kind of medical uh, mm -hmm you know, deduction. So I, I think this is going to be slower adoption. I think you will see it in call centers for hospitals and scheduling and, and those kinds of things. And, and I'm looking forward to just seeing that slowly move from the business side over into the, uh, into the clinical side. Last thing, gamification of health has always fascinated me. You know, when we can get kids interested in health earlier, when we can get, um, you know, people competing with each other to be healthier, uh, how, do, how do you see this playing out and are, are you seeing this, are you having a lot, some conversations around gamification? Gamification is cool. You know, a few years ago, Jay McGonigal was one of the keynotes at Chime talking about using it to um, help patients learn about how to combat like cancer and to give them like if they're beating, if they're winning the video game, they know that they can beat the disease as well. And you're starting to see it come into back office operations too, because processing claims isn't the most exciting job every day, but if you can make it a game uh, and win, you know, that daily total, et cetera, then it <clears throat> helps to engage your teammates. So the gamification piece to me, I think about, and I don't have kids, but I hear about kids like being obsessed with this game called Fortnite. Imagine if you can take that, the things that people, kids are learning in Fortnite and teach them how to eat healthy. Hey, by the way, time to get up and go exercise or go run around and play outside for 30 minutes, et cetera. So the fact that we have this current generation, um, so, I mean, their whole life revolves around just the technology um, making healthcare a, a game is just the natural progression of something that you'd want to do. And, and I'm hopeful that that's where, you know, parents and, and providers are starting to spend more time is how do you make healthy choices smart? Because I spent all my time outside growing, uh, grow outside growing up as a kid. I know today kids stay in front of their devices and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, let's make part of that, you know, a game as far as getting your steps in at whatever age you need to get into. So yeah, gamification for healthcare, it's just a matter of how we integrate that into kids today more than anybody. Yeah. Uh so you have a, a distributed staff, and we've talked about the talent shortage and, and challenges in, in that perspective. So uh, you, you mentioned that you, know, you hire people really for the right skill wherever they're at. So what are some of the ways to affect the, that you effectively manage a distributed or remote IT staff? What we're doing right now, so you and I are doing a video chat, 
Um, you know, obviously in person is best, but video is second, phone, I say is always third. So using that video connection and being able to actually see somebody and half the fun is the fact that they may be at home and you have a beautiful backdrop and I have a wall today because I'm in one of our remote offices. But on especially on Fridays, about once one Friday a month, I'll get to work from home. And I tell people, beware, because you're going to see me in, in, with no makeup, and my hair's in a ponytail, and I've got my cup of coffee, and my cat might do a drive-by. But you know what's really cool about those types of uh, interactions with people is that they get to see you for who you are. And the most important, whether it's video conference or not, the most important aspect to any relationship with any teammate is a personal connection. I start every single meeting with an icebreaker. Some of, and some of them are profound, like, hey, if you could meet one person from the past, who would it be? And some of them are like, hey, what's in the trunk of your car? Uh, and then we create these like fun stories around all of those. So getting to know them personally is the most important thing that you could ever do. Uh, and the reason I do things like icebreakers and fun facts is that teammates who have worked together for 20 years, Bill, find out things about each other that they never knew before. Like, I don't know anything about you. And those are those personal connections. Like you care last night that the Bengals won for a teammate who likes the Bengals, whether you care or not, but you know that that happened and you say, hey, great game last night, et cetera. Um, you extend the length of your one-on-ones and you, and you have an agenda to talk through. I'm a big agenda person. People give me grief like, oh, I always have to have an agenda when I come to one-on-one -on -one with you. Well, of course you do. Because what happened since last time we met, what are your roadblocks, all the basic things that you want, but they're, they're owning and driving that conversation and it's, and it's very realistic and it's important in person, uh, personal. Um, and I always say that the culture trumps everything in an organization. So what culture are you creating for teammates, whether they're remote or otherwise, is creating a place that they want to come to every day, even if what they come to is a video screen. So I would say that always the biggest tenants, create an amazing culture, get to know them personally, um, and be transparent and focused. So right now, I'm not look, the phone's not ringing, I'm not looking at other things. You have to be dedicated to that time you spend with them and not be distracted by anything else that's going on. Fantastic answer. I, I really love the, uh, the icebreaker questions. That becomes one of those things that, you know, it might, people might gloss over in the answer, but I, I agree with you knowing that somebody's a Bengals fan, somebody's, um, you know, into skiing, somebody's into whatever, somebody loves the Olympics. That's, that's all great stuff. It, mm -hmm. Even as simple as you come to, you know, hey, we're, we're buying each other gifts for Christmas or whatever, those gifts become more personal because you, you know the person. Yep. And I think people, that's one of the things that people miss. When you walk into somebody's office, you can tell a lot about them. Like, mm -hmm. for instance, your office and your Star Wars gear, which people don't see right now because you're not in that <laughs> office. But, you know, the first time I walked in, I'm like, oh, that's, you know, that's that. And you had a 49ers. Uh, uh, you just, when you walk into yeah. somebody's office, you can just tell a lot about them. Yeah. And that doesn't happen remotely. And so you have to, you have to generate it. You have to figure yeah. out a way to get it out. That's awesome. Uh, so we've talked about people need to own their own career. And uh, this is another one of those questions I like to revisit often with different people from different perspectives. What are a couple of ways uh, you have seen that done effectively, people really owning their own career over the years? The number one thing is to, you, you have to own it and you have to be able to, even if you don't know, like, hey, I'm gonna be this when I grow up, the, I call it curiosity and continuous learning. I remember one time when uh, someone said to me, college was always gonna, gonna happen. And my mom always used to say, the reason you're going to college is because no one can ever take that away from you. Once you have a degree, it's yours. And then it was like, hey, you probably should get your master's degree because you're gonna need it to get promoted in the future. And that was a good choice and I'm glad I did it. But it wasn't like it was a one on done. You have to constantly be curious about what's around you. Join HIMSS, join CHIME. Uh, I recently just joined the Southern California Society uh, for Information Management. It's a bunch of CIOs that aren't in healthcare because I need to know what's happening outside of my world too because otherwise you get so myopic into like, hey, I've been in an organization for X amount of years and I know how to do this one thing. Um, knowing how to do that one thing well is great and you've got to be able to know what's happening out in the world around you. And so there's a level of dis comfort. I had a, a colleague once ask me, how do I know when it's time to move on or how do I know when I need to be doing something different? Like when it's easy, when you are almost terrified about the fact that you have all these deliverables that you actually maybe don't know how to do all of them, you should almost always have a level of discomfort in your role because it means you're challenging yourself. And as soon as it's not a little bit scary every morning when you wake up, it is time to learn to do something new. It doesn't mean you go like, find a new job, but I mean, go learn about data science, go get a certification, go take a class at UCLA Extension, like 
constantly challenge yourself to do something that you don't know how to do. Yeah, that's, that's uh, great advice. Um, Sarah, as always, uh, I love having you on the show. Thank you for coming. Um, you know, what's the best people, best way for people to follow you? Follow me LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. Uh, I'm just Sarah Richardson. It's, um, there's probably, I think there's a lot of Sarah Richardson's in the world, but mine has a big leadership banner behind it. Um, at concierge leader for Twitter. Um, or I just tell people, you know, just email me, um, S Richardson at healthcarepartners.com, but also Sarah at concierge leadership.com. Um, and just for that final plug, I am looking for a subject matter expert to talk about chat bots on the Southern California hymns podcast. And if it's, if it is a vendor, the rules of engagement are that you can't sell your product on the podcast. You just have to be able to talk about what it means from an industry perspective. So anyone out there who's a part of our world, Bill, who is really in, a, in the chat bot space, uh, give me a call. Uh, let me know. I would love to have them on as a guest. And uh, you are going to be coming up as a guest on the podcast too. So um, need to give you the date and organize it, but uh, it's going to be fun to have you. And you get to pick your topic because uh, you pretty much have covered all of them. So yeah, I, you know, uh, yeah that, and I'm looking forward to that. That'll be great. It'll be great to work on a Saturday with you and your, you have a really cool studio. So I'm, I'm yeah. looking forward to, to getting a part of that. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, the, at the patient CIO, Health Eric's website, uh, writing. And uh, don't forget the, the shows on Twitter as well, This Week in HIT. And check out the website, thisweekinhealthit.com and catch the videos on the YouTube channel that we talked about this week in healthit.com slash video. And uh, please come back every Friday for more news information and commentary from industry influencers. That's all for now.